Vayisa Yaakov Eina Vayarin Esav Ba. Yaakov raises his eyes and he sees Esav is coming. Vayimo Arba Meosish. He's got 400 men. Vayachatz Es Hayelodim Alea Vealrochel Ashtea Shvachos. And he groups the. How does, how does the Eretz go translate Vayachatz? Um, he divided them. He divides the children up among Leia, Rachel, and the, and the two maidservants. Uh, now, you should have a question right here. Something. You should be curious about something. Didn't Yaakov Avinu divide his people into two camps? He divided them into two camps. So if Yesav kills one camp, he won't kill the other camp. Won't, he won't he wipe out the other camp. So what are they all doing together over here? He had divided them up. He put a day's... He put a day's distance between the two camps. And one of the reasons, by the way, is very interesting. You know why he put a day's, he says, that he says put a day's distance between them, the Medrash says. You know why? Because Rivka had said to Yaakov when she sent him away, you know, I don't want Esau to kill you. Why should you both die in the same day? So Yaakov, somehow they knew that him and Esau were going to die in the same day. And Yaakov figures, okay, so I'll put a day's distance between the two camps. That way, if he kills me, he's going to die in the same day. He won't be able to get to the other camp. That's why he puts a day's distance between them. Now, what are they all doing together? What are they all doing back together? The answer is that Yaakov Vino has seen a sign. What was the sign? That wrestling match with the man, Soro Shel Esav, Yaakov sees that as a sign that Esav is not going to be able to defeat him. He says that as an omen, a sign, you know, you have to be a person who could read signs. Signs are very tricky to read, by the way. Signs are very, very tricky to read signs. You've got to be careful when you start reading signs. And we are not readers of signs, because signs are a double-edged sword. Imagine, imagine you decide you want to go, you want to, go to the, uh, the old age home to go visit somebody. You get to the bus stop, and just as you get there, the bus pulls away. Is that a sign? Well, sure it is. What's it a sign of? Don't know. Could be a sign, well, today's not the right day to go. Or it could be a sign that, let's see how, let's see how determined you are to do your mitzvah. Right? And therefore, you don't read signs. Don't read signs, because we don't know we don't know what signs are. Do the logical thing. If it's logical not to go because you don't have time now, you miss the bus, and your time you get there, you're going to get back, you're going to be late for whatever it is you have to do, that's something else. But don't go reading signs and making life decisions because you don't know how to read signs. I'll tell you my favorite. I, do you remember my favorite Shidduch story? My favorite story. My favorite story when it has to do with Shidduch. There's this guy decides he wants to get married. So he goes to, you know, they have the, uh, uh, you've heard of the, what do you call it, Amuka? You've heard of Amuka? Yeah. yeah, where people go to Davin for a shidduch. Rabbi Yonasan Beruzil is buried there. And he left, he said, anybody come to Amuka and you Davin for, Davin for a shidduch. So this bacher goes to Amuka and he wants to go down to Amuka. So first he goes up to Tzfas for Shabbos. When he gets to Tzfas, he sees a young lady in a brown dress. And he's absolutely smitten, absolutely smitten. Okay, but he's a bacher, she's a bacheret. You know, I obviously can't talk to her. Fine, he goes to Amuka on Motzei Shabbos, but he goes to Amuka, he gets down there, and just as he gets there, guess who's leaving? Young lady in the brown dress. You know, that is unbelievable. And he davens at Amuka, and if somebody leaves a sitter, he sees somebody who left a sitter behind. He opens up the name sitter, he says, his name is Rachel Schwartz, whatever it is, with an address. He goes to Yerushalayim, knocks on the door. Who answers the door? Young lady in a brown dress. He says, this is unbelievable. Here, I love you lost this. He gives her, gives her, the, okay. A day later, he gets a call from a friend, and says, I have a girl for you. Yeah, what's her name? Ruchel Schwartz. Where's a brown dress? That's the one. You know, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> then starts checking out. Next day, next day, another friend calls. Got a girl for you. What's her name? Ruchel Schwartz. Where's a brown dress? This is unbelievable. Two weeks later, they met, and six weeks later, six, seven weeks later, they met. Six weeks later, they got engaged. Three months later, they got married. And two months after that, they got divorced. I always tell that story to guys when they start going on Shaduchim. You don't go making decisions based on signs. You make decisions based on logic. So a nice girl, she's got the right life goals, dad's got money, marry her, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> the, only signs, the only signs we look at is dollar signs. That, yeah, so other than that, no other sign. We don't look at omens, we don't look at signs. You don't know, what does an omen mean? You go, oh, well, you know, I can't believe it. I went to Amuka and there she was, and there she was, there she was, therefore you marry her. That's like, you don't make decisions like that. It's irresponsible. You don't make decisions. You make decisions based on, and what's interesting is, what's interesting is because what happens is when you're on a when you're on shidduchim, you'll see you're on shidduchim and it gets close. Then the girls do something like the girls are going to ask you that one question. This is going to be their life decision. They're going to about to decide whether they put their life in your hands based on if like if you were stuck in an elevator and you only had one candy bar and you can listen to one tune, what would it be? I said, well, definitely, you know, a baby Ruth bar and, and, and you know, and some, something from the Beatles. And I can't believe it, me too. You know, that's your Ziva for eternity. You know, I got news for you. I know, don't go making decisions like that. You know, that's not, we don't read omens ever. 
you be, live based on logic. You live based on like Yaakov Avinu, he sees this as obviously through a prophecy or whatever it is. He sees that's a sign that he's not going to be destroyed by Esau. Therefore, he brings the camps together. And that's why they're all together when they get to this meeting. Now, um, he approaches Esau and take a look. Um, puts a, uh, three lines from the bottom. Who of our leaf Nehem Yaakov went out ahead of everybody? He bows down seven times till he reaches his brother. Yaakov bows, and he bows again, and he bows again seven times. He bows, each time he bows, till he gets to Esav. Now, we're going to see Yaakov Avinu, Chazal criticize Yaakov Avinu for being too submissive. Now, this is very, very tricky, very difficult to understand, because we find at the time of the second base of Migdash, when the second base of Migdash was destroyed, the Romans, they went out to uh, negotiate. They wanted, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai wanted to negotiate with the Romans. Remember the story? And there were the Biryonim. The Biryonim were the, uh, uh, the, young, the young militants who refused to listen to the Rabbanim. They burnt all the supplies in Yerushalayim in order to force them into open combat with the Romans. And those Biryonim are criticized severely. There are those that say the, the Masada was those Biryonim. They ran off to Masada and they fought the, they, they, they barricaded themselves. Those are those, those, the, 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 those, Rome, those uh, 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 militant uh, group who refused to accept the authority of the Torah scholars who said that we should negotiate with the Romans. So these uh, Biryonim, the Gemara says, they're severely castigated for taking on the Romans and not submitting. Now, why should Yaakov even be criticized? And he's criticized, you, you, you submitted. Why? Wait, you submitted too much. So the commentaries point out that why so, you know, it's difficult to be a Jew. It's difficult to be a Jew. I shouldn't say difficult. It's challenging. Because on the one hand, you have to submit. On the other hand, don't submit too much. That means we're, hold, we're held to a very exacting standard. There's a certain amount, but not more. How much is that amount that you have to, that you have, to have the correct judgment to decide how much should I submit, but don't go above and beyond what would be acceptable. And therefore, Yaakovino, to a certain extent, is, Yaakovino is, is what do you call it? Yaakovino is, is, is a subject here to a certain amount of criticism for over-submitting to Esav. However, now this is the kicker. This is what we want to get to. Vayoratz Esav likras. So Esav runs towards Yaakov. Vayichab keyu, he hugs him. Vayipol al tzavar, he hugs him around the neck. Vayisha keyu, he kisses him. Vayivku, and they cry. So they always used to they always used to tell us that you know why are they both crying? Well, you know, uh, uh, Yaakov is crying because he knows that if the guy kissed him, it's going to cost him, and Esav is crying because he had to kiss the Jew. You know, they, they, that's what they used to say. That's why they're both crying over there. But you notice the word Vayishakehu has dots over it. The word Vayishakehu has dots over it, and that means that in a Sefer Torah, although a Torah does not have vowelization, the Sefer Torah is only letters. When you look in a Torah scroll, you'll see that over the word Vayishakehu, there are dots in the Sefer Torah. They have to be there for the Torah to be kosher. They have to have these dots in the Sefer Torah. Why are there dots over the word? So take a look at Rashi. It's in the left column, four lines from the bottom. If you find it, please, please show the person next to you. Uh, Vayishakehu, says Rashi, nokud olov. There are dots over the word Vayishakehu, which means that we're supposed to derive something from it. V'yesh cholkim b'dover, is a b'raisa free. There are different opinions in the b'raisa and the gemar, in the, in the medrash, there are different opinions. What do those dots indicate? What is the message the dots are trying to convey? Yesh shedorshut nekuda zolomar, shelo neshoko b'cholibo. There's some in opinion that say, you know, well, I kissed him, but with dots over, it means he didn't kiss him with a whole heart. Now you have to understand, they haven't seen, these are brothers, they're twin brothers, and they haven't seen each other for 20-something years. So there is going to be a certain amount of emotion here. So Esav runs forward and he kisses him. Yaakov softened him up by bowing down, submitting, sending the gifts, bribing him. So Esav runs and he kisses him. One opinion is, yeah, but he's kissing him with half a heart. Amar Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai says, I disagree. Halacha hi biyadua, it's a well-known halacha, she Esav sone li Yaakov. Esav hates Yaakov. It doesn't say sona in the past tense, by the way. It says it in the present. Esav hates Yaakov. Ella shenichmeru racham of boso shah. At that moment, he was completely emotionally overcome. V'neshakol b'cholibo, he kissed him with his entire heart. There's a medrash that says that not only he didn't kiss him, he tried to bite him. And Yaakov's neck turned to marble and Esav's teeth broke. And that's the dots on top are symbolic of broken teeth. 
right? There, there, there is a medrash like that, okay? Now, let's examine this. So there are two opinions here. There's one opinion that says, well, you know what? He, uh, 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 he hugged them, but it wasn't with a full heart. There's still a certain amount of reserve because of what Yaakov has done. There's some history there. And so it's a, it's a certain amount of reservation. The, uh, uh, the other opinion is Rosh Bar Yochai. Now, what do you know about Rosh Bar Yochai? What do you know about Rosh Bar Yochai? What's that? He wrote the Zohar. Where did he write it? He was in a cave. A cave for 12 years. Why was he in a cave for 12 years? Because the Romans were trying to, there was, he was a fugitive from the law. The Romans were trying to kill him. So he, better than anybody else, knows what it's like to be with Esau breathing down your back. And he's hiding in a, he's hiding in a cave for 12 years. He's hiding in a cave for 12 years. By the way, I wanna, while we're on the subject, I want to clarify something so there shouldn't be a misconception. It's their Gemara. It's a Gemara in Shabbos on Daf Lamed Gimel. And the reason I remember it is because Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, what do we celebrate? We celebrate Lagba Omer, which is Lamed Gimel. And it happens to be on page Lamed Gimel in the Gemara and Shabbos. I don't think it's an accident. And the Gemara says that first they were hiding in a shul. And then the pressure increased. The Roman search parties got a little more intense. And Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai said to his son, Nashim Daitan Kalos Aleim. They're going to pressure the, my wife, your mother. We better run off. That's when they went off to the cave. Now, that expression, <clears throat> Nashim Daitan Kalosa, means women are, this is a mistranslation. People, it literally means women are light minded, which obviously we are have taken criticism for. Well, there you go with your chauvinistic attitudes again. You know, you're a bunch of chauvinists. And they translate it as feeble minded, right? We never said feeble minded. It says light minded. Nashim Daitan Kalosa So, what we spoke about many times is men's minds and women's minds work differently. But one of the explanations, what does it mean women are light-minded? What does that mean? So again, obviously, chas there's never anything derogatory in our literature. We don't say derogatory things. We're telling you the facts. The fact is, a woman has an ability that a man does not have, called multitasking. You ever see women in the house? Right? They start cooking supper, change a diaper, put some stuff in the laundry, go back to check the stove, break up a fight, nurse the baby, change another diaper, go back to the stove. And they're moving from one talk on the phone, they're moving from one thing to the other. Put a man in that situation, how long would you last, guys? I would, I would, I would go, absolutely not, I would go. I have gone bananas in that situation. You're absolutely, you could go, you could go, into, you could go mad doing that. I love my kids dearly. But I could only do one thing, you know why? Because men are heavy-minded. When I'm doing something, I'm completely focused and concentrated. I can't be involved in something else. And if I have to, it gets you, it's very unnerving. You know what I'm talking about. And that's why when, when I, whenever I did anything for the kids, when I had to take care of them, if I did it, it was like, well, I had to make them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's like, you know, it's got to be, you know, it, it's, it's what the kids just kind of looking at you, you know, daddy, I'm hungry. You know, and a wife, it's like, Next, oh, next, you know, they, you know, and then she's putting in the lawn. You're doing it, and I'm like, hey, one second, I'm on peanut butter. You know, Picasso is working on his on the peanut butter, and the kid. My wife once said to me, if men fed the kids, they'd probably starve, and which is possible. I, my, I, I can't say not. And and what happens is, a woman is light-minded. She's able to effortlessly move from one task to another. It's a blessing. That's her job. She's in domestics. And therefore, she has to do that job. So Shimon Bar Yechai and his son, they know more than anybody else what, what, what Esav feels about them. So what does he say? Halacha hi biyadua. It's a known halacha to Esav son Eliyakov. That's a fact. But in this situation, what happened? Esav actually overcame himself, and he hugged Yaakov with a full heart. Now, the question that the commentaries talk about, the point the commentaries make over here is, what kind of statement is it? It's a halacha that Esav hates Yaakov. Esav meaning the anti-Semites of the world hate the Jews. What do you mean it's a halacha? Which halacha is it? Yeah, let's learn some kids or shulchan. Okay, today's halacha, yeah, goy, the anti-Semite has to hate the Jew. What kind of halacha is it? What does that mean? It's a halacha. Why is it halacha? He be it's a known halacha. Days of Soma Yaakov. What's the answer? What's the answer? The answer is, do we understand all halachas? Do you understand why you can't eat pork? Do you understand why you can't wear shotness? Do you understand why uh, why you have to put up a mezuzah? Ultimately, we don't understand. It's a halacha. You have to do it. Rashi's telling you over here. He's quoting the Gemara. Rashi's telling you that this is a fact of life. 
And that's why all the books written about anti-Semitism, analyzing why there's anti-Semitism, this and anti-Semitism, that, the books are excellent books. Many of these books are written are excellent books. If you ever have a table at home that's wobbly and you need to put something to wedge something underneath it, that's what you should use those books for because that's what they're worth. Right? Some of the books fit very well. Some of them are very thick books. So if you have a really wobbly table, it goes in. And then if you need to make a bonfire on Lagba Omer, then the books are excellent for starting your, your bonfire. That's what the books are worth. All the, all the experts who analyze anti-Semitism, we know why there's anti-Semitism. You know why? Best answer in the world. Because. That's it. One word book. Right? That's it. Because. Right? It, well, no, the Jews, if the Jews wouldn't be so involved in money. Yeah, okay, so what are we supposed to do for partners? Well, if the Jews would be a little more like the Goyim. So they try to be like the Goyim, so they put you in ovens. Okay, if the Jews should stay, Jews are, we're always accused, uh, you guys are always sticking to yourselves. Right? So we join in. So what do they do? So then they, they get even more upset. So, so what do you want from me? What do you want? The answer is, there's anti what's the real reason of anti-Semitism? Because your very existence makes the anti-Semite uncomfortable. Because he sees the Jew and he understands the Jew has a value, and Jew is living for something more than just this world, and you are the conscience of mankind. Which is, by the way, why the secular have it in for the religious. Right? There's nothing you could do. There's nothing you could do, and it's not your fault. You represent their conscience. I was once in a doctor's office. I was in the doctor's office, and I was, uh, was uh, there's a lady there, and I was in the waiting room. And I was probably about as far, you know, she was sitting, it was a long table. She's sitting down where Daniel's sitting. I was sitting on the other side of the, uh, side, and I had a chumash with me. And I was very careful, and I know, I know when I'm guilty, and I know when I'm innocent. I've been guilty plenty. This time I was innocent. And I was very much, you know, and all of a sudden she looks at me, she goes, would you quiet down? This isn't a shul over here. Okay, you know, so I quieted down. Yeah. So she goes into the doctor, and then I, then afterwards, uh, I go in. And I said to the doctor, was a religious guy. I said, you know, well, I was eating her. I mean, she gave me a hard time out there. He says, oh, you, oh, her husband is a German non-Jew. Right? Well, the woman's married to a German non-Jew, and I'm sitting there with the Chumash. My very existence is bothering her. And there's nothing I could do about it. You, you with your Chumash represent everything wrong with what I'm doing, and I can't tolerate that. You're irritating me. You're absolutely irritating me. And therefore, you're the conscience. That's what's bothering them. You're behaving like a Jew. And I want to be Jewish without behaving like a Jew. I can't stand you, because you're making me uncomfortable. How? What did I do wrong? You exist. Well, i sorry. That's going to continue for a while, hopefully. You know, so we can't do anything. Uh, you could join us. We can't, you know, nothing we can do about that. That's what Ace of, Ace of hates Yaakov. Whenever Chazal are darshaning things, there are different ways it could have happened. One way is either, either, remember that, you know, there are the 13 principles of Rabbi Shmuel, 13 principles of Rabbi Shmuel, the, how you darshan things when you learn Gomorrah. So when it comes to the non-halachic parts of darshaning, there are not 13 rules, there are 32 rules. So the same way we can't apply the 13 rules because there are too many possible combinations and complications. That's why the Talmud became a sealed book. In these areas, it's even more complicated. There are 32 rules with, 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 with combinations and sub-combinations. Now, when it comes to uh, Hillel and Shammai, now we're opening up a whole, we're opening up a, 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 a whole thing I think is important for you guys to understand. You have a situation where, well, one of them's wrong. Either he did hug him with all art or he didn't hug him with all art, right? It, 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 what, what, okay, gentlemen, we are the board of directors of the, uh, par, of the Pilot Pen Company, okay? We are the board of directors. This is the new model pen, and I want to give it a name, okay? A one-word description, which is going to be the name. This is the new blank-shaped pen, okay? What are you putting into the blank? What shape is that, Yona? One word. Spaceship. The spaceship-shaped pen, okay? Max, anything. The fish. The fish-shaped pen. Okay, we're going to come back to that. <laughs> anybody, Joe, anybody? The smooth-shaped pen. Mr. Fogel? The missile-shaped pen. Okay, we're getting closer. Yeah, go ahead. Gavriel, anything? You could say the same thing somebody else said, by the way. You could say the same thing. Bottle. The bottle-shaped pen. I would call it the rocket-shaped pen. You could say anything you want. What do you say, Jeremy? The master-shaped pen. The? The 
Master shaped pen. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Harry. Anything. You can say what's been said, by the way. You can repeat what's been said. You can repeat what's been said. Oh, can I change mine? You can change yours, I yeah. I want to change it to intuitive, it's intuitively. The intuitively shaped pen? Yeah. Leave, do me a favor, get out of here. Get out, get out. Okay, we'll see, we'll see. Yeah, okay, all right. So, okay, so what happens is like this. What happens is like this. We go around the room. Seven of us said it's the rocket shaped pen, for example. Two say it's the uh, uh, ruler, it's the, uh, uh, the, the missile shaped pen. Okay, now we have to, now, is it a rocket shape? Well, yeah, that's not wrong. Is it missile shape? That's not wrong. Is it fish shaped? <laughs> that's wrong, right? This is not, I've never seen a fish like, however, we're gonna come back, it's important you said that, okay? Now, what that means is like this. None of us are wrong. It's rocket shaped and it's missile shaped. How do we reach a conclusion of what we're gonna call it? We take a vote in the board of directors. The majority rules. That's what it means, you're both right, but we pass like Beis Hillel. That means I've applied the 13 principles or the 32 principles to my conclusion. If you applied the principles correctly, there's more than one possible conclusion. And based on those principles, this is a rocket-shaped pen. No, based on the principles, it is a missile-shaped pen. Okay, we're going to vote. The majority says rocket. We're going to call it the new rocket-shaped pen. So you're right for rocket. You're right for missile which means that you've applied Torah properly. You're Beis Shammai, you're Beis Hillel. Fish, you're the reform rabbi, right? You did not apply it properly because you came to the absolutely wrong conclusion. It's not even on the chart. That's what the Ritva explains. You understand? If it's objectively correct, but we're not poskating like you, okay, so you were wrong and you were wrong. You hold it from an angle. What shape is this? What shape is it? It's straight. Okay, that's true. It is straight. What other shape is it? It's round. So it depends what your angle is. So when it comes to something like this, there are one of two possibilities. Either they applied the rules of darshaning it, and each one came with a different conclusion. But the dots were there to be darshan, and there are rules for how to darshan dots. That's one possibility. Sometimes there was no darshaning at all. Sometimes it was just a tradition that was handed down from Sinai, what the dots mean. But the fact that they came to opposite conclusions, and this is where it gets very subtle, this is where it gets, we don't really care what actually happened. That's not what our interest is. Our interest is, according to our understanding of Torah, what happened. Right? It's not a history lesson. Right? If we apply Torah, what happened? Well, he hugged him. If we apply Torah, what happened? Well, he kissed him with half a heart. What really happened? <laughs> what's, the guy, what's the difference? I'm more interested in the rule of Torah application to understand, and ultimately, whichever way you go with it, there's a life lesson for you. Ultimately, there's going to be a life lesson. But that's how you can get an argument in the Gemara. The Gemara will argue about what did the base of Migdash look like? How was the base of Migdash? How was the base of Migdash? Well, I mean, what a silly argument. And just go to, you know, go get, go, 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 go look at the archaeological digs or wait till Mashiach the comes and they'll tell us. The answer is, what does the Torah indicate? Based on the verses, what are the indications? And you're both right based on how you understand it, as long as you've applied Torah accurately and responsibly. If you didn't apply it accurately, then you're outside of the grail. You're outside of the graph. You're outside of the grill. And whatever, whatever, whatever you said is not legitimate. It's not. It's not a. We cannot submit that as a possibility. Okay. Now take a look. So, um, a very interesting little exchange now. Vayisa sees the women and the children. Vayomer mi Who are they? Those are the children who God has graced me with. Something wrong with that exchange, gentlemen? See a problem in that exchange? No oh, Yaakov doesn't say about a word about the women. Esav didn't either. Esav just looks around and says, Whoa, who are they? It says that he, it says Esau sees the women and the children. He says, who? one second, one second. He says, who are these people? Who are they? So Yaakov says, oh, these are the children that, 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 that. Now, what, what's Yaakov saying? What they, he knows, he knows what Esau's asking. What's Esau really care about over here? You care about the, you care about the little kids over here? What's Esau really care about? Hey, who's, a, yeah, you know, who are the ladies over there? Right? So what does Yaakov do? Yaakov plays a game which is a very interesting game in life. When you can play it, you play it well. He says, oh, those are the children. 
meaning you were obviously a tzaddik like you wouldn't be asking about the women, well, would you? <laughs> right? Yeah. He says, oh, those are, those are the children that God has blessed. Now he's so stuck, because he'd really like to know about you. He's not about to say, yeah, but who are the chicks? You know, he's not about to say that, because he, what he wants is, and that's what he really would like to know, but he also doesn't want to be seen as being a lowlife. So there are certain times in life where you can actually trap somebody. It's a great situation when it happens. Yeah, it makes your day. You can actually trap somebody in that situation and get them in a like, <clears throat> you know, like, and that's what Yaakov does. He answers about the children. Now, everybody goes and bows down, and Yosef and Rachel bow down. Yosef stands in front of his mother so that Esau shouldn't get a good look at her because she's beautiful. And then Esau and Yaakov also have another exchange, which is an indication of our approach to life. He says, what is that whole camp that I met? All those, those flocks that you, sent the, that you sent me. Vayomer Yaakov says, I want to find favor in your eyes. It's a gift. Vayomer Esav, Yesli Rav. Ochi yehilacha asher lach. Esav says, I got a lot. I got a lot. I'm loaded. I don't know. You keep it. I'm loaded. Right? Who talks like that? President of the United States. Right? I'm loaded. I got so much. You can't imagine how much I got. Right? I'm loaded. Right? What does Yaakov say? Vayomer Yaakov, Alna, please not. Imno matzasi chedmecha. Find favor in your eyes. Vilakachta min chosi miyadi. Take my gift. I see you the way I've seen the face of God. You know, I, you're important to me. Take my blessing. God's been gracious to me. I got everything. What does he mean, I got everything? He doesn't mean, I got the whole world. That's not what he's saying. What's he saying, I got everything? I got everything I need. I don't need more. I have everything. I'm satisfied with what I've got. That's the difference between the Esau's and the Yaakov's. He says, I'm loaded, right? I'm loaded means load me up some more. <laughs> yeah, Yaakov here's like, Yaakov, and Yaakov says, no, 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 please, Esau, you know, it's like when you sit there, please take, no, no, you take, no, no, you take, no, you take, okay, I will. Right? And Yaakov here says, don't lose this, don't lose this. Make sure you come out, make sure you come out with Esau, get it in his hand. I'll tell you, there's a very, very, there's a very interesting story that you, you've heard of Chaim Brisker, right? So Chaim Brisker was, you know, he's, uh, he's one of the great uh, scholars who gave, gave us the path in how we analyze Gemara. So in Brisk, they had a, the, 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 local, the local governor or whoever it was, and the first governor retired. And a lot of the Jewish problems were settled by greasing the guy. They were able to grease the guy. So uh, uh, then he retired or he died, and a new governor came in or mayor, whatever it was, and he's a virulent anti-Semite. And he made it known to the Jewish community. He's making a decree. He made some sort of anti-Jewish decree. And he also made it up, don't even try to bribe me. I don't want money. I will not take money. Don't bribe me. Okay? So Reb Chaim Brisker calls the heads of the community together. He says, all right, guys, you're going to have to go grease him. They said, uh, but he won't take the bribes. He won't even let us in to see him. Reb Chaim says, get, you're going to have to try Okay, so they get the money together, and they get the, they well, get a thousand rubles together, and they go down to the buddy call, the, the guards won't even let them through. And they come back, and they say to Rukhaim, they, you know, sorry, he won't, uh, no, no go. Rukhaim says, give me the money, give me the money. It's a hot day in June. Rukhaim Brisker puts on a heavy raincoat and an umbrella, and he takes the money, and he goes down to the guard. The guards know he's the chief rabbi, so they let him in. So he comes into the mayor. And uh, the mayor says, Rabbi, you know, nothing's going to help you. I'm not rescinding the decree, and then nothing's going to help. So Rabbi Chaim said, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to rescind the decree. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to see if you would. You don't want to rescind the decree, that's fine. He said, yeah, Rabbi, why are you wearing a, why are you wearing a raincoat? And why are you wearing a heavy raincoat? It's a, it's a hot day in June. So Rabbi Chaim says, well, because, uh, you know, my, uh, my grandmother came to me in a dream last night, and she said there's going to be a storm today. By this afternoon, there's going to be a storm, a thunderstorm. The guy looks out the window, it's blue sky, 70 degrees. He says, there ain't going to be enough storm today. He says, no, my grandmother's ever running. There's going to be a strong. There's going to be a storm. He says, not going to be any storm. He says, listen, I'll wager 1,000 rubles there's going to be a storm. So the guy, 1,000 rubles, there ain't going to be no storm. Right? So the says, okay, we'll see. So they wager 1,000 rubles, right? Comes back two hours later, and there's no storm. He says, well, I guess I lost the bet. He puts 1,000 rubles on the desk. He walks out. The mayor's sitting there, he goes, 
boy, that Jewish rabbi is smart. I avoid it, and he rescinds the decree. <laughs> right? The main thing is get the money in his hand. Get the money in his hand. Once the money is in his hand, then you're able to. Then you could. Then you. Then you could. Then you. Then you could. You'll be able to deal with it. Get the money in his hand. Now, so Yaakov Avinu's attitude is: I got everything I need. That's the biggest blessing for a Jew. Biggest blessing for a person to be satisfied with what you have. Because if you're not satisfied with what you have, there's no end to it. Not satisfied with what you have, then you're always going to be missing something. The blessing is Yeshli Kol. He says, I have everything I need. So then Esau says, one more point. He says, you know what? Let's travel together. We'll tra- let's go traveling together. Great offer from great offer from Esau to Yaakov. Let's travel together. So what does Yaakov say? love. You know that the children are very, very fragile. They're delicate. The cattle, and I'm loaded down with cattle. But if I could be of Echad and you push them, you're going to rush them in one day. The sheep are all good. The cattle will all die. Yavor, no, I don't have time. You know, you go on ahead. I'll go off slowly. The regular Malacha Shalafanai. Because of everything that I have to do. Until I, I'll meet you eventually in Seir. I'll meet you back in your town. So what's Yaakov saying to Esau? He's talking about a, a world view of a difference in ideology. He's saying, you are living for accomplishment, for glory. You're living fa- what we call fast-paced. You're living fast-paced. You're hungry to achieve something. You're always rushing to get to the next level, more money and more position and more honor and more pleasure. You're a fast-paced. You're, you're, you're a Manhattan guy. Right? Everything is just fast. Everything is fast. Your whole life is fast. You're just ru- in a headlong rush. We're moving along slowly. We're not, we're not rushing anywhere because there's nothing that we, we really want to do other than grow as people. So we're not rushing along. We've got a complete difference in ideology here. And eventually, I'll get to you. We'll come. You go on ahead, and eventually, I'll meet you in Seir. Question, gentlemen. Does Yaakov Eve ever go to Seir? No. He never goes to Seir. So Gemara says, we learned a very important lesson here. If anti-Semites ever stop you when you're traveling, and they say to you, where are you going? Always tell them a farther distance. Always tell them somewhere further, and then cut out in the middle. Right? You're going across country. You're going from New York to Cleveland. An anti-Semite say, where are you going? Where are you going to L.A.? Oh, okay, so then they'll wait. Then at Cleveland, you get off the bus. At Cleveland, you hop off the bus. Right? They say the Punovich Rov was once in New York. He got on the subway. And some uh, four guys come over to him, and they started up. They, he could tell that the, uh, what do you call they're starting up with him. So he knew that he was in trouble. He was alone on the subway car with these guys. So he walks over to me and says, can you tell me how to get to a certain street, which is way off, way down, right? So they said, okay, and they're sitting there because they know he's going to get off at that stop, and then they'll get off with him, everything will be good. All of a sudden, halfway, Potovitcher suddenly waits to the last second, subway train stops, and just before, he also gets up, jumps off the train to do his clothes, and he just kind of waves to the guys as, as the train pulls off in the distance. So you always, the Gemara says, if somebody asks you where you're going, always tell them. Yaakov says to so yeah, I'll meet you in Sayer. Yaakov never goes to Sayer, he's not interested in Sayer. That way Esau will go off to Sayer and he'll wait there for Yaakov, you know, he won't hassle him now. Okay, we'll stop, we'll, go to, we'll continue next week. Yeah,